So we went into this place, it was like a meditation cell, just with a wooden bed and this wooden pillow and a thin blanket and a mosquito net, game changer, you need a mosquito net there. Bell would go at four o'clock in the morning and you get out of bed, <laughs> of wooden bed, and you get a bucket of cold water. We, we each got a kind of big ladle, big trough of cold water, splash yourself with cold water a few times, and then we'd all walk towards the meditation hall and we'd do a little bit of Tai Chi or yoga, some kind of physical wake up. And then we'd do Anapanasati for about 16 hours. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. Rabbi Dov Birkon, when he was younger, had the last conversation of his life with his grandfather. And that conversation made Dov Bir, little Dov Birkon at that point, run to Asia. And he was there for six years where he became a Buddhist, a Hinduist, and many other things. And he thought he had it all. He thought he found the ultimate way to live life until he found Judaism. Here's my conversation with how Rabbi Dov Berkon was born into a Jewish family, went through the many religions, and ended up with Judaism. This episode is in memory of Shem Deva ben Yaakov Shlema, as well as Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. In this episode, you will hear about how Bitbean's custom-made software for your company can take your success to the next level. You will hear about how Twillery is changing the game when it comes to suits, and also how for just $7 an hour, hiring for less, will provide you with top-notch quality staff. Here is my conversation with Rabbi Dov Berkon. I'm Yako Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Rabbi Dov Berkon, you are now a rabbi at Aisha Torah, but your trajectory of your life didn't really seem like it was going to end up there. Can you tell us about your background, your childhood at least? Grew up in a beautiful, healthy, loving, traditional Jewish home. Both my parents are South African. So we had Friday night dinner, but then I went clubbing afterwards because hmm. that's what we did downtown London. And I actually started DJing a bit, dance music. And I went to Manchester University. Have you been to England? I have been to England. Yeah. My friend Moishi Apter. Huh. I don't know if you know. No, I don't. Not yet. <laughs> Manchester University, I did philosophy, hmm. which was a complete waste of time to be honest. And I was into the clubbing scene, which was... You're saying clubbing was a little more exciting than philosophy. A little bit more exciting. Okay. Although if I knew what I knew now, I'd love to go back and do a philosophy degree. Hmm. See, what, see what my philosophy masters, teachers over there would think about my journey. And because I learned much more philosophy after that, I left England and I lived in Asia for six years in Japan and Thailand and India and Nepal and Sri Lanka. Why did you go to Asia? What were you looking for? In university, in about the third year, I just started looking around and I saw no one's particularly happy and no one's living particularly meaningful, purposeful, deep lives, lots of depression and divorce and just getting by. I actually started asking people, how are you? It was a project. How are you? Top five answers, can't complain, getting by, hanging in there, could be worse, not too bad. <laughs> I think that's a very big contrast between the UK and America. Because the UK, it's it's very like, not bad. Like, it's honestly honest. And America's like, great. And like, people say great, but like, you know, that's not, it, the, the word doesn't match actually what they mean. Have a nice day. Right, exactly. Fine. Fine stands for feelings inside, not expressed, mm. I think. So I realized, hold on, this is not a good trajectory here because no one seems to be living amazing lives. And everyone you speak to, you say, what do you want in life? And everyone says, I want to be happy. But I look around me and I, I don't see that many people who are consistently and authentically happy. And then my grandfather died when he was 100. And before he died, he said to me, you don't want to live a, an I should have life. So I said to him, what do you mean? And he said, when you get to 90, you don't have a lot to look forward to. So you start looking back on your life. I really should have spent more time with my family, less time at work, and I should have traveled a bit more, and I should have worked out what's the purpose, should have worked out how to be happy. I, there's lots of things I'm thinking now and I'm regretting I didn't do, but you can live your life from this age that when you get to 90, you're not regretting your life, that you're actually looking back on your life and thinking that was amazing, I had an amazing life. And I also think how many 90 years old people are doing that, to look back and think, you know what, I nailed that. That was amazing, my life was amazing. 
So I came out of his room and I was like, that's so important to work out. And I just worked out, you got three basic steps. What's the goal? How do you achieve the goal? And then just do those things. And so it looked to me that the Western secular world didn't have the answers. And I grew up in London, very close to a very religious area, Golders Green. I didn't have much contact with religious Jews, but they didn't seem like the most spiritual or even necessarily the most nice people mm -hmm. I'd ever met. So Judaism didn't seem like an option. So I, I started doing martial arts and watching lots of Bruce Lee films. And Bruce Lee was my first Rebbe. Because <laughs> at school, don't know how it is in America, but no one ever said to me when I was 11 years old, you know what, you're going to face disappointment in life, and here are three things you should know when you face disappointment. Don't take it personally, you can feel your emotions, but then go and change, change yourself. So no one gave me any life skills, how to build a healthy sense of self, how to do anything. So Bruce Lee said, don't pray for an easy life, pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. And I was like, I hear that, Bruce. So, like, thank you, Rabbi Lee. <laughs> his real name was Baruch Leibowitz, Bruce Lee. It's not true. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure he's Asian, but am I <laughs> that, the wrong person? That wasn't true. Okay, got it. Okay. Everything else I say is true. That okay. So I was like, right, I'm out of here. And I started studying Buddhism at university. I just spent hours in the library at Manchester University reading all, all Buddhist texts and any spiritual, mystical stuff I could get my hands on. Why is it that so many Jewish people that are trying to find the meaning of life go to Buddhism? I don't know. Is there like, I don't even know if there's like stats or numbers on that, but like. Well, firstly, I think 40% of practicing Buddhists in America are Jewish. Wow. And 60% of Buddhist leaders in America are Jewish. You get a bit of nachas, at least they're the leaders. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it's because if you look at a Buddhist monk, they're very chilled and peaceful. And we live in a world where most people are extremely stressed. When you look at a Jew, and this is not fair, by the way, but often when you look at a, a religious Jew, they're not necessarily looking at the most healthy people and not necessarily behaving in the nicest way. I used to think that in the Torah, it must say somewhere you have to wear a black hat and behave really badly on the airplane because mm. that's your impression of, of on the surface level. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the Torah on a very, very superficial level, it seems like there's an angry man in the sky who's going to punish you if you don't do his silly little rules. Mm -hmm. And he needs us to jump through these hoops, otherwise he'll get very upset with us. And he's very egotistical. And, and the prayer book is, God, you're so great and awesome and holy. And I'm like, God, you're so insecure that you need me to tell you how great you are the whole time. So on a very, very surface level, Judaism doesn't seem to teach deep, profound spiritual wisdom. And many religious Jews don't seem to be living any sort of conscious life. So if you go into a Buddhist temple, you get an immediate sense of deep peace. And if you go into a Hindu temple, you get a sense of like ecstatic trance. I, I did many hours of mantra meditations in Vrindavan, the capital of the Hare Krishnas and Often when you go into a synagogue, it's, it's not the same. <laughs> Seems like people are just trying to get this out the way and they're looking out the window and they're mumbling the words and they're getting out. So on the surface level, Judaism doesn't necessarily match up to the more spiritual looking religions out there. So you go and search where it seems that the wisdom is. Okay, so someone like me who doesn't know much about Buddhism or Hinduism, could you describe what, your days were like there, what life was like, and what were the things in there? And, and I'm sure we'll connect it to how it's really from Judaism, but like the <laughs> things from there that you were like, whoa, that's, that's great. That's, that's a great concept to help me connect to God on whatever level. Firstly, I did lots of 10 day silent meditation retreats. Tainas Deber. Yeah, yeah. Tainas Deber, there you go. So it's, I don't know if you've been silent for 10 days before, but this is why I haven't stopped speaking since then. <laughs> I can't stop speaking. But complete silence, but also not only silence, no reading, no writing, no listening to music, no phones, no TVs, no nothing, no distractions. So really forces you to go inside. I think that would freak me out. It would freak most people out. Even like, if we so would- so scary. I, not that I don't like myself, but like boredom just freaks me out or just being with myself. I like myself. 
but like that's too much. Ten days? Well, for most people, even ten minutes right. would be very confrontational. So our sages actually teach us that the ability to be alone is our most fundamental ability. Adam was created alone. Mm. And then it says, Lotov liat Adam Levado. You're not meant to be alone, but you're meant to be able to be alone. Because only then can you really interact with other people in a very healthy way, not because you need or power or anything. So even th something like boredom is, we'd call it the Yet Sahara. It's your, your negative side stopping you going deeper. So for example, you'd just watch your boredom. If you're, if you're in the temple and there's nothing else to do and you start feeling boredom, what we tend to do is we jump up. I'm bored. I better do something. But the boredom is actually an anti-spiritual thing that's saying, hold on, I don't want you to go any deeper. Because if you just start watching the boredom and just say, you know what, I'm bored now. And that's okay. You actually dive beneath the boredom and into your soul. Really, that's what we'd say. By the way, Buddhism believes you don't have a soul. Mm. Anatta. It's called Anatta. We don't have a soul. But anyway, we'd wake up at four o'clock in the morning and we slept on wooden beds, no mattress. And when I arrived in the temple, the, the head monk gave me a block of wood. And he said to me, this is your wooden pillow. And I said, no, that's a block of wood. <laughs> and he said, no, wooden pillow. I was like, I sure it's a block of wood. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, whatever. It's all in your mind. <laughs> so we went into this place. It was like a meditation cell, just with a wooden bed and this wooden pillow and a thin blanket and a mosquito net. It's game changer. You need a mosquito net there. Bell would go at four o'clock in the morning and you get out of bed, <laughs> of wooden bed, and you get a bucket of cold water. We, we each got a kind of big ladle, big trough of cold water, splash yourself with cold water a few times. And then we'd all walk towards the meditation hall and we'd do a little bit of Tai Chi or yoga, some kind of physical wake up. And then we'd do Anapanasati for about 16 hours. Ana means breathing in and Pana means breathing out. And Sati means consciously, consciously breathing in and out. For 16 hours straight. Not for season hours straight. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, we had a, a meal, our only meal of the day, which What's was the rice and some vegetable. Very, very good food, by the way. After you waited all day to eat something, <laughs> anything would be good. And at 6 p.m., we had a warm cup of soya milk, which was good. And sometimes we did some walking meditation as well. Hold on. So when you're, could you take me through what this meditation is like, and a panacity very yeah. very simple by the way many people come up to me now and they're like rabbi teach me to meditate <laughs> and they think i'm going to say well imagine a yud and a hey and a, <laughs> oh, yeah. gotta get the cabal over here and I, I know what we actually have to do is you sit up straight and you just start breathing through your nose and you can count five seconds or whatever but just breathing very deeply through your nose filling up your lungs and then releasing your breath that's it and getting into a flow Breath coming in and breath coming out of flow. Now, what's going to happen is that after about a quarter of a second, your mind is going to freak out. As you're describing this, I'm like, am I, is there something wrong with me? Like, this is, is bugging me out yeah, yeah. to imagine me doing this. <laughs> Why? Why is that? Because your thoughts completely dictate your reality. Your whole experience of life is completely dictated by what's going on in your mind. So if you're having good, healthy, uplifting, sweet, non-judgmental, loving thoughts, then you're going to have a good life. And if you're going to have not such good thoughts, you're not going to have a good life. And it doesn't stop. The second you wake up until the second you go to sleep, that voice is just going, commenting and doubting and fearing and hoping and dreaming and judging and all sorts of stuff going on in there. So as soon as we try to calm it down, it gets even louder, actually. You'll, you'll notice that. So what's, what would happen is after a quarter of a second, your mind's going to freak out. I can't do this. I can't do this. Actually, I'm quite good at this. I mean, I've got to tell my friends about this. I, I, how long is this going on for? All you have to do is, as soon as you notice that, just smile. And this is, a very, this is going to be the key to everything. Don't fight that voice. It's stronger than you. There's no point trying to analyze it or just acknowledge it and smile. There is a the famous Kabbalist, he also says, just smile at your Yetzirah, smile at your negativity, and it takes away its power. Mm. And all you have to do is, you, as soon as you notice the voice, stop, smile, and then bring your attention back to your breath coming in and going out. And what's going to happen is, after a quarter of a second, it's going to shoot off again. I got to do this. I'm so bored. I'm so nervous. I got anxiety. I got, it's gonna, your whole inner world is going to freak out again. 
And all you have to do is catch it again and come back. And then try. And you'll get one breath. And then that would be an improvement. And then, and so people think when I'm not focusing on my breath, it's a failure. But it's actually the opposite. When you notice that you're not focusing on your breath, that's a victory. It's a mindfulness. You were mindful. You were aware. And you brought it back. And basically, over time, you get better at staying focused on your breath. And you get better at catching your mind quicker. And basically, what you're doing is you're literally training your mind to come into the present moment. Because the present moment is very, very peaceful. 99% of your thoughts, firstly, are about yourself. But secondly, they're in the past or the future. You're planning and you're anxious or you're worried, doubting, judging, or you're thinking about your past. Memories, good memories, bad memories, regretting stuff in your past. So the mind, by definition, is in the past or the future. But the breath is in the present moment. So being able to just focus on your breath can bring you into a much more deep, calm, peaceful place. Did you find after doing these kinds of meditations that your personality changed? I don't know if calm is a better, is a, is a good definition, but like being a little more whole of a person or not necessarily, doesn't poorly. Um, yes, immensely more whole as a person, but there are good sides of the personality. I actually say that the more calm you can be, the more excitable you can be as well. <laughs> mm. Some people are introverted. But often introverts are introverted because they're afraid to be around people. They don't have self-confidence. Some people are extroverted, but that's because they're scared to be alone. Mm. So neither is necessarily so healthy. But someone who's so okay with being alone and peaceful, then they can really be out there. So I was always, I was the captain of the football team at soccer. Mm, okay. Captain of the soccer team. <laughs> And I, I was a DJ and I was, I was always very out there, but I didn't have peace of mind. So often when you don't have peace of mind, even your personality is kind of, that's just automatically coming out of you. Once you can get peace of mind, then you can be really extroverted, but in a healthy way, not because I'm running away from anything. It's just because that's who I am. I like being around people and I'm sociable. But hold on, I'm curious. If you're doing these exercises or whatever exactly it's called, for like 16 hours, I could imagine doing that for like a day or two, but like doing that for a lot of days, weeks, years, like is that, it sounds, sounds like a jail in a certain way, no? I think your mind is a jail. <laughs> you not being able to control, I said to someone the other day, who is in control of your thoughts? Your mind, and he was like, I am. And I said, okay, so why do you keep thinking about your ex-girlfriend being with that guy? <laughs> I knew him very well, by the right, way. Yeah, I'm yeah. actually very nice. You know? <laughs> yeah. But just for example, what percentage of most people's thoughts would you want happening in there? That is the prison. The mind itself is a prison. The other example I gave the other day was, imagine you're in a car and you're driving, you've got a three-hour drive and there's music you don't like playing. So you can either just sit, listen to that music for three hours, it's driving you mad, but not do anything about it, or... You can start analyzing and judging, why is this music on? I hate this music. My mum put this music on. Or you could just turn the music off. So most people are in the prison of not being able to turn that music on, not being able to deal with their minds. So what they do is then smoke weed and watch Netflix and do all other things to try and escape. And it doesn't really work in the long run. It's fascinating. It's also so much easier for you to notice someone else's entrapments and yourself I know myself personally, like I'm like complaining and like my brother and my mother and my wife, they're like, why are you going back to whatever it is? And it's like, and myself, I'm like, yeah, I understand now, but we get so, it's just like you're saying, it's a part of us, our, our past or things that we struggle with. It's just there and it's hard to get out of that. But still, hold on. My question is that, that like, I, I get it. I get, I, I agree that there's, there's a level of like, being so present is like the best bracha, but still it seems a little depressing though to constantly just, or boring, no? Like just to do that. If you said do this for like two minutes a day, I'd be like, okay, I hear. But like to do full days of that, is that the goal? Do, are people still there from your time still doing that? Okay, well, this is one of the key differences between Buddhism and Judaism. Okay, let's get into it. Buddhism says, let's say life is like treading water. So you're in the ocean and there's so much coming at you. So meditation is basically, let's go and sit on the beach for a little bit and just reset and calm down. A Buddhist would say, and now stay on the beach for the rest of your life. 
Judaism says, no, you're meant to be in the water. You're meant to be feeding orphans. You're meant to do a lot. But it's very important to be able to do it in a very calm and healthy and present way. So it's more like making a lifeboat in the water. Mm. So the 10-day retreats are important training, but we're not meant to stay there. We're meant, we've, we have this balance between retreating and, and coming back into the real world, which is probably the main key of Jewish spirituality is getting the balance between spiritual and physical, really, being in the world. I, I had this Buddhist master, Tan Medi, amazing guy. He was actually a 41-year-old lawyer from Bangkok. He had a wife and a son, and he basically left them to become a monk because <laughs> he said, you know, attachment causes suffering. It's the main Buddhist teaching. Attachment causes suffering. So if you get attached to things, then it, it creates pain, causes suffering. So just retreat, go into the mountains. And so I was in India once and I was meditating and I was trying to overcome my ego. And I realized after a while that it's pretty egotistical <laughs> just sitting here in a cave trying to overcome your ego. <laughs> There's a famous Buddhist story, actually. There was a, a monk and he went into a cave for 15 years or something and he overcame his ego and they asked him, you know, come down and teach us. You can be, be our teacher. And at first he said no, but then they convinced him. And on his way, someone stepped on his foot and he said, do you know who I am? I'm the monk. And he realized, oh, no, I didn't overcome my ego. So he went back to the cave for another 15 years. So I never understood that story because it's easy to overcome your ego when you're in a cave when there's no one bothering you. When, when it's, then it's very easy. Mm -hmm. But when it's 20 minutes before candle lighting on Friday and you've and you got three children and, and the food's not ready and you haven't washed the floor and 10 guests are coming in, can you overcome your ego in that moment? That's a much, much higher level to be able to do that. There's a much higher level of self-mastery to overcome your ego when you have responsibilities and you've got the rent to pay and you've got family to look after and you've got things to do. However, you can only really get to that level if you also have some retreat time. It's like, uh, our retreat time is training to get back into the world. So some people, if you don't have any retreat time, then it's very hard to deal with the world. But if your whole life is retreat time, you're missing really what the purpose is, which is to be involved in the world. Would you say that attachment causes suffering? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, no. There's a very big difference between pain and suffering. Pain is an unpleasant feeling, either physical pain, you bang your knee, or emotional pain, someone dies or you split up with your partner. That's pain, unpleasant feeling. Suffering is a mental narrative. It's your mind not dealing with the pain. So for example, I feel lonely. That's painful. But then you have suffering, which is, I wish I wasn't lonely. I hate being lonely. I'll always be lonely. It's my fault I'm lonely. It's her fault I'm lonely. If I wasn't, if I was married, I wouldn't be lonely. If I wasn't married, I wouldn't be lonely. Mm. Whatever it is, is your mind not handling the pain in a healthy way. So attachment can cause pain, but it pain doesn't have to cause suffering. We can overcome suffering. We can feel our pain. So when someone passes away, you're meant to feel pain, but we don't have to have the useless commentary. It's the mind that's not improving the situation is not helping in any way. So attachment causes pain, yes, but not suffering. Could you walk Not necessarily suffering. Not necessarily. Sorry. My favorite moment from this entire episode is coming up. But first, let me tell you about our friends. Two friends that are going to help your business in very different ways. First off, hiring for less. Thank you for all of those who've heard about them in the past episodes that reached out to them and actually got 50% off their first week. And more than that, hiring for less is essentially a way that you could find the next full-time employee. They're overseas, they speak really good English, and hiring for less walks them through to the needs that you have. So I get very often asked about photo editors and video editors, boom, hiring for less could help you get the right video editor. Or you're gonna say, I need a graphic designer, or I need someone to help me with my accounting or my data entry, whatever it is that you don't need to actually be doing to run your business, but someone who could be trained in could do, you could get an employee from hiring for less, and they're just $7 an hour. But the fact of them that I love the most is that they there's no like hidden fees or like $7, um, um, $7 an hour plus $200 a week. No, it's $7 an hour. That's how much you pay. And it's 
literally 280 a week. Of course, you're going to get your first week for 50% off when Wait. you call and say, hey, Living L'Chaim sent me. Their phone number is 845-682-0990. Or of course, you could hit them up at hiring the number four less.com, the link in the show notes. You could call them, you could WhatsApp them, you could text them. They're very great and easy to deal with. And you all are doing things in your business that you don't need to be doing. Or you know what? It could be like your life, right? You're, you're like, I need help managing my schedule and and I have so many things going on and I have a, a wig salon and I have so much, I need customer service support. Boom, hiring for less will get you the help that you need. And there are so many more examples that I didn't even mention. So go to their website to see what it is. And if you're not sure, call them, ask them, talk it through. I got a few thank yous from people saying like, by the way, it was just so easy to deal with hiring for less. So go ahead, give them a call, look at their website. And very soon, you for just $7 an hour could have your next employee. Now, let me tell you about my friends at Bipping. But first, I'm going to snap my fingers and magically we'll have a guest appearance with someone helping me talk about BitBean. Here we go. Ellie Langer, host of Kosher Money. What do you have to say about the magic of BitBean? So BitBean, in a nutshell, creates custom software. But what does that mean? Let's yeah, let's do some mean? role play. Let's get it. Okay? okay. Your name is Jeff. Okay. Jeff, you What's have- What's your name? I'm Ellie. I'm not changing. I don't know if I see you as an Ellie. Okay, fine. Jeff, mm -hmm. you work in the healthcare industry. I have a mustache also. Specifically, you've worked for healthcare companies and you have an understanding that nursing homes and assisted living facilities have a tremendous amount of billing, right? There's a lot of billing there. They have patients, billing needs to happen. Sometimes they outsource that. So you said, hey, I know how this business works. I'm gonna create my own business and help other facilities and bring on more clients. And make more money. Build a business out. So Jeff, you have three clients. You have 10 employees. Things are working great. Great. Now, I have excellent news for you. You just signed a big account. Now you have 25 clients. I'm very excited, but I'm also a little nervous. So when it comes to billing, there are uploads of documents, faxed papers that have to come through, tons of moving parts. You can already start to see that you're now going to have to hire and hire and hire and hire, which is great. You do need a core team. But what if I told you that there was a way to save on not just employee salaries and hiring, but also you can save on process? I would ask you, how do I do that? Bitbeam. So you would speak with them. They would understand the core pieces of your business, mm -hmm. how you're operating, um, communicating with um, those facilities, and then build a custom solution, not just you telling them what to build, but they have a, a good understanding of what software you would need. And you would literally, literally, literally save hundreds and hundreds of hours a month with clean process. You'd be able to sleep at night. And oh, by the way, you can go from 30 clients to 300 clients because the software works for you. I love that. That's great. I actually got to meet the people at Bitbean. They're like, Yakov, they, I'm like, please call, call me, me Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> like what? I'm like, oh, we're gonna do an ad that, it's a long story. They are confused about that. But everything else was great when I went there, met with them. Um, very smart, intelligent, and you mentioned this. Yeah. Kind. Yeah. Very, very kind. nice. Very nice people to deal with. So uh, if you're ever in Lakewood and you want a tour, I could give, well, my alter ego, Jeff, could give you a tour. But more importantly, go to bitbean.com to learn more about how they're going to take your business to the next level. Thank you, Ellie. And now back. Oh. And now back to this week's episode. Oh, got me there. Could you walk me through more of like your experiences in Asia of like what you're doing? And I don't know, I find it Ooh. fascinating. I, I I met a lot of people from like Flatbush. They, you know, I, I more or less could tell you their background. You, it's it's very interesting to me. Well, the first place I went was Sri Lanka, just because it was the most random place I could think of the, of the <laughs> time. I finished university. I got a decent degree in philosophy. And I was like, I'm out of here. I got to work this out. So I went to Sri Lanka and I started teaching English in a very, very small village. And I worked in the orphanage there. Thank God I had an amazing childhood, amazing parents, upbringing. So I got to these orphanages and I really felt that firstly, I have so much, therefore I have so much to give. I felt very responsible. And 
lots of them had never seen a white person before and they freaked out. They were like, he's got some disease. And then <laughs> after drinking their water, I did have some diseases. It wasn't the best water. Lots of them didn't have electricity. There was no running water. So you get this middle class white North London Jew boy <laughs> and you stick him in this hut in the middle of the Sri Lankan forest. And I tell you, I never felt more at home. I was like, this is just so good and so alive. And what is it? Because you felt like a purpose? Purpose, firstly, but purpose beyond myself. Mm. It seems that in our world, in the Western world, life is really about yourself and your career. And if someone says, I, I happened with my son, he, he won't do it again. I want to film him. But someone said to him when he was about seven, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a tzaddik. I want to be a good person. They said, no, no, you don't understand. I mean, like, what do you want to do? And he said, well, I want to pray and help people. They said, no, your job. And he was like, I'll get a good job helping people. Because in the Western world, what do you want to be and what do you want to do? That's your career. That is your, you're defined by that. And I didn't buy into that, really. So to just be like roughing it, I just had a small backpack, nine kilograms. And it was just so, I just felt so alive. Wow. Okay. So from Sri so, Lanka, where do you so go? I, yeah, very quickly. So Sri Lanka, I was working in the orphanages, no running water, no electricity, amazing kids. By the way, they were happier than most of my friends. Lots of these kids with polio, the muscles in their legs don't grow. They're crawling on the floor. They don't have parents or they have alcoholic parents. They have one meal a day, no running water, no electricity, happier than most privileged people. And that's because we very rarely appreciate everything we have. And we always want more and we take things for granted and we're always looking, well, they've got more and he's got, I want what they have. And they had the gift of real, I really appreciate and have gratitude. They were, they had one pencil between about five children. So I ran into town. There's one street in the town and I bought them each a pencil. It was the best day of their life. They couldn't believe it. It was like, for me, teacher, my own pencil. I was like, yeah, your own pencils. So that was very, very eye opening for me. And it just felt like these people were just simple, pure, kind, humble, sweet people because they weren't in this crazy rat race to try and become something. And then so from Sri Lanka, I went to Thailand for a year and a half. And that's where I started doing the 10 day meditation retreat. So I was meditating in the temple. I got very friendly with the monks in the temple in my village. And I used to go for Shachris and Mincha. <laughs> and then I went to Thailand and I taught in a university. I, I speak Thai, not so well anymore, but I spoke Thai and I taught Buddhism to Buddhist monks and played lots of football. Thank God football, soccer, yeah. is the universal language. Mm. It's amazing. Everywhere I went, like in the mountains of Nepal, in the Himalayas, you get some little village, there's a football. So that was a, lots of football everywhere. And then at sunset and sunrise is meditation time. It's very beautiful. Nates and Shkia, it's like, and what do we do? We connect, it's powerful. So that was Thailand for a year and a half. And then I went to a smaller island off the coast of Korea called Jeju Island, a complete beautiful paradise island with a volcano, not active anymore, but it's the one of the three holiest mountains in Korea. So we used to climb a Halasan, it took about four hours to climb up and we I trained Taekwondo there. And my master was the former high school Taekwondo national champion, about six foot seven, huge. And Korean people aren't usually that big, huge guy. And so he made us run up the mountain in the snow and strip down to our boxer shorts and tra like proper like, training. My whole life is based on Rocky <laughs> and, and Karate Kid. So I was like living this amazing, I just thought to myself, yeah, based on my grand grandfather, I was like, I just want to do amazing things. And when I'm 90, and look back, but my bucket list wasn't, I'm just gonna get wasted here. And my bucket list was, I wanna train myself, body, mind, soul, and go scuba diving and had that bucket list as well. But it was really a training for living life. What is the purpose and how am I gonna achieve the purpose? Beautiful paradise island for it. And taught, everywhere I went, I taught English to make some money. And then I was in India for a year and a half and did some more 10 day silent meditation retreats and yoga retreats and volunteering in orphanages and hiking in the Himalayas. I went to Nepal for a month. And then I went to China for, I trained in Shaolin. It's the world capital of Kung Fu and crazy training 
run down the mountain at four o'clock in the morning, sprint back up the mountain. And, and my master had a wooden stick, a bamboo stick. And if you stopped, it'd smack the back of your leg with a bamboo stick. It, was good. it, like, it felt like Kill Bill, though, you know? <laughs> <laughs> felt like that. And then, so we did some training there. And then Japan for a year and a half did Aikido. So I got a black belt in Taekwondo and then brown belt in Aikido and just teaching English. And uh, so that was six years, basically. Wow. Well, I was going to go and canoe down the Amazon. I wanted to canoe down the whole Amazon. But I stopped in Israel for three weeks. Hmm. Made that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> 16 years ago. Yeah. And have you left Israel since? I haven't left. Wow. Okay, fine. So you're going through that life. So w when right before you get to Israel, what are you feeling? Like, are you achieving that, in quotes, happiness that you were looking for? Yeah. I'm feeling quite enlightened and full of real consistent joy. I was actually sitting on a mountain in Nepal, meditating. I used to go every morning sunrise over Annapurna mountain range. And I had this experience where I realized, and I'd learned this a lot, that the less you need, the happier you'll be. The less you want, the happier you'll be. So most people actually think that happiness is the feeling I get when things go my way. So when my team wins, I feel happy. When my kids are doing well in school, I feel happy. When there's nice weather, I'm happy. So then they start chasing the external world to match up to their expectations in order to be happy. That's why no one's happy because hmm. you can't always get what you want. And even if you do, it's not going to make you happy because your team will lose the next week and your kids will have this problem. So I realized that I only need three things. And if I have these three things, I'll always be happy. It was like salvation moment. Number one was meditation, because as we said, your whole life is your mind. If your mind is peaceful and calm and pure, then you'll have a good life. The second one was learning, reading books about growth. And the third one was- Money. No, I'm kidding. kidding, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and money. It'd be like a total stira. So hold on, sorry, let's let's it. Meditation. Meditation, books. Like Education. Education. But not just any books, learning to grow, mm -hmm. power of now, those good books okay. and okay. exercise. Exercise. Wow. Because a lot of spiritual and emotional health is based on physical health. If you're not physically healthy, it's very hard to deal with life and you don't have as much energy and vitality and you can't get up early and you can't do what you want to do. So, and then I realized even if I'm in like isolation, I'm in prison whatever it is, solitary confinement, then I'd at least be able to do meditation and push-ups. So I'd still be happy even there. It was a, an amazing moment of, I'm now going to be happy for the rest of my life. Wow. And the, what, what the meditation is doing is, once again, if you think about the ocean, if you have storm, crazy big waves crashing, crazy big noisy stuff, if you go under the water, 10 meters, 20 meters, very calm. It's very peaceful there. So all of our issues in life, all of our self-doubt and anger and hatred and jealousy and envy and fear, it's on a very, very surface level of us. But your breath can take you just into a much deeper place and you can live from a much calmer, healthier place and not get so caught up in the waves crashing around you. Based on your perception of Orthodox Judaism, what changed in Israel that you were open to it because i feel like you're in in this world of enlightenment and breaking free and now all of a sudden you're going to the world of like black hats and and tzitzis and uh, you know whatever all whatever orthodox judaism is yeah. what what shifted for you well the first thing that shifted was i was on a kibbutz for a couple of weeks and there was one religious guy on the kibbutz and he said come on you're jewish why don't you learn judaism and i said because it's male chauvinistic and outdated and strange and he said, just go and learn a little bit more. And I went up to Sfat, which is like the Nepal of hmm. Israel. And I started learning that very simple things it would seem, but we don't believe that there's an angry man in the sky who's going to punish us for doing, not doing his stupid rules. We believe in infinite consciousness. And even the name God, Yud and He and Vav and He, Yud in Hebrew grammar is the continuous. And He, Vav, He is Hove, which means present. So God itself is the continuous present, being in the present moment. Basically, I started hearing ideas that I was actually very familiar with. Right. And I was like, I, I believe, I like that. I yeah. believe that. So I had a whole list of this is why I don't like Judaism. But then I started learning, hold on, we don't believe that. This is not, and, and if God is infinite consciousness, 
that means that I'm an aspect, I'm a finite aspect of infinite consciousness. So when I'm praying and I'm saying, God, you're so great and holy and mighty, I'm not talking to an egotistical man in the sky. I'm saying I'm part of something great and which that made a lot of sense to me. That's beautiful. In fact, the word for to pray in Hebrew is lehit palel, which is reflexive, which means you're really doing something to yourself. Palel has many meanings, but one is to connect. So lehit palel in itself means connecting to yourself. So in prayer, for example, we, we praise God. God, you're so great. So once again, there's, God doesn't need praise. It's for me to live a life of wonder, see how unbelievable life is. And we request things, but God knows what we need. We don't need to request it. It's for me to understand my values. What do I really want in my life? And we thank God the whole time. So God doesn't need thanks. It's for me to be able to live with gratitude like the kids in the orphanage. The word Yehudi, Jew, actually comes from the word Lohadot, which means thanks. And the first thing we say in the morning is Madeani, which means gratitude. So I was suddenly learning all these beautiful, deep ideas from Judaism. But I, I always had my one question. This is very, very, very unspiritual right now, <laughs> which is, how do you know this is true? Mm -hmm. How do you know it's true? Because I love it. I think it's amazing. But Millions of people think if you don't believe Jesus died for your sins, then you're going to burn in hell forever, which is interesting, could be. But I wanted to know, how do you know it's true? So I, I asked my Buddhist masters, how do we know this is true? And they said, because Buddha said so. And I said, but how do we know he got it right? And he said, well, you feel it in your meditation. It's very lofty meditation. I said, I know that's what you say, but I also meditated with Hindus. And I experienced the same thing in my meditation. And then they just explained it through the Hindu lens. Right. By the way, Hinduism is much closer to Judaism than Buddhism. Hinduism says that basically Einod Milvado, there is God, and that we're a piece of God. Very, very similar. The, word, the main God in Hinduism is called Brahman, and his wife is called Saraswati, which mm. is Abraham and Sarah. There's right. many, many things I started to discover. I asked everyone, what, what's your evidence for this? And it can't just be because you were told it, and it can't be because you experienced it, because you experienced all sorts of things. So... I, I said, look, I like Judaism now. I see what it's teaching and it's very deep and profound, but how do you know it's true? And I thought I was gonna, that would stump them and then I'd go and canoe down Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> but they said, we have evidence. Cause I did philosophy at university. I used to think to become religious, you have to be kind of a depressed 19 year old. Mm. And then someone's gonna come and brainwash you. So I was 29 years old by this point and I studied philosophy and I was very happy. I was, I was living an amazing life. I had no interest in being a religious Jew, but I asked the question and they said, there's evidence that there's no way a human being could have written the Torah. So they sent me to Aish and I went to Aish and I, I said, I hear you have evidence, show me the evidence. And they showed me the evidence at which point I sent it to all my atheist friends and just any atheist I could find. And I said, what we're going to do is we're going to refute the evidence hmm. and we'll show them that it's not true. And then I'll go and canoe down the Amazon. And in the meantime, have you heard of the Israel National Trail? Shreel Israel? No. Oh, you have now. Okay. So walking trail from the Lebanese border to Elat is 1,100 kilometers, 650 miles, something I, like that. I have no clue. So that's a big walk. 650 miles. I'd done a longer walk around a Japanese island, a 40-day walk around a Japanese island to 88 Buddhist temples. So I said, you know what? I'm going to walk from Le the Lebanese border to Elat in 40 days because I'd learned about the spies. There's a whole story in the Torah that the Miraglim, the spies, they walked the land for 40 days and they gave a bad report. So I said, you know what? I'm going to mataken. I'm going to fix that. And I'm going to walk the land in 40 days and say good things about Israel and raise money for the orphanages I worked in. So I walked for 40 days, not on Shabbat, I took the day off, and I was debating the atheists on the way and listening to lots of Rabbi Tatsirim. And no one could refute the evidence. So I slowly started seeing, not only is it beautiful and profound and deep if you understand it, which I don't think even most religious Jews fully understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, but I can also prove, I can show deep evidence that there's no way a human being wrote the Torah. There's things in the Torah that no human being could have known, um, which is very, very empowering because for me to believe anything, it has to be based on evidence. It, otherwise, it's just blind faith. You can believe whatever you I believe. Mm. So the foundation of our belief is evidence, but then the 
practice itself has got nothing to do with rational evidence, it's to do with your heart and your soul. So I found the training in the East really helped my Judaism because mm. my putting on my tefillin is much more conscious now and I can daven with more intention. So that really helped. But then I found out, hold on, Judaism, we have a whole beautiful meditation tradition <laughs> and then the Kabbalistic traditions. So I was like, this is like a full package here. Once you understand it, it's just difficult to understand. Every Every kid in Thailand when they're three years old knows what meditation is. They might not do it, but they know what it is. Your average religious Jew doesn't know about true spirituality, what God really is. They don't know. David Amelech says, Tamu ura'u kitav Hashem. You have to taste and see how good Hashem is. Taste is an experience. That's what it is. So if you've never eaten strawberries before, there's nothing I could ever say to tell you what strawberries taste like. I could talk about strawberries all day. You could learn Masechta strawberry. We could have with the gematria of Tut Sadeh. But until you bite into a strawberry, you're never going to experience a strawberry. So too, Hashem is meant to be an experience, an emotional experience. And it's not easy to get there. For me, the whole rest of Judaism is just a mindfulness tool. Why do we have a mezuzah? Is to wake you up and be like, you know what? There's a divine, infinite, loving creator of the universe who's keeping your heart beating right now. Why do we say blessings? Same reason. Why do we put our right shoe on first and then our left shoe? It's all a whole path of mindfulness, but is meant to be taking us towards an experience. It's like reading the maps, but never going on the walk. If you just learn Torah and say brachas and daven three times a day and you're doing mitzvahs, but you're not having the experience, you just read the maps. You didn't go on the walk or you go to the restaurant and you're reading the menu. And you read the menu for half an hour, oh, teriyaki, salmon on a bed of basman. You got to order the food and taste it. So Judaism is meant to be taking us towards an experience of infinite consciousness. It's such an interesting fact um, because I personally feel like, you know, I, I grew up with such a great, loving parents. They're awesome. Ma and daddy, they watch this, so hi. Um, but like still, I personally felt that the Judaism that I knew was like just a bunch of rules. And I'm like, at a point in my life when I was in Israel, I'm like, I'm not happy. There's, it's like, I'm doing this just to follow the rules. Like that's not exciting. And it's ironic because maybe rules is the wrong word, but the rules are there to help you live a better life. And it's so ironic that so many Orthodox Jews just go through life of like, gotta follow the rules, gotta follow the rules, gotta follow the rules. And it's like, wait, are you actually taking those rules to, make you think and actually connect to Hashem, like, or or not really. I think of like the, um, I forgot which one, like some some Rosh Hashiva who they're learning about like um, the, the, the the types of damages that people could do. And um, one of them is a bar, a pit. And he put like a uh, cheer in front of the base medrash. And everyone just continued learning and no one moved that chair. And he's like, You're, we're studying for the past like four months about a pit. And and the damage they could do and the obstacles in people's ways. And like, practically, this is there. Like, why is no one actually doing something about it? Yeah, you get caught up in, in the rules and you forget what they're there for. So many people think that the rules limit you. But the rules are what help you express yourself. My martial arts masters, they said, you got to block like this. And if I blocked a little bit wrong, they said, no, it's got to be that angle. That's not restricting me. That's helping me block better. Mm. My wife's an amazing artist. Why, and I'm a terrible artist. I do love drawing, but I'm terrible. Why is she an amazing artist and I'm a bad one? She went to art school. She knows the lines and the shading and the perspective. I play the keyboard. I play the keyboard because I never said to people, no, don't teach me your scales and limit me with your rules. It's only because I know the rules of harmony and what goes that I can play the keyboard and the piano. So it's only within the rules that you can really be free. Sounds like a Bruce Lee line. <laughs> but really, Ravi Lee, Ravi Lee, Shlita. Yeah. So people said to me, my friends said when I was becoming more religious, they said, you're so unlucky. You used to be so free. You could eat what you like and smoke what you like and do what you like. And, and now you're so restricted. And I, and I was like, freedom isn't doing anything you like. In fact, you're a slave to your physical desires and to your ego and to your society. That's slavery. Freedom is really knowing what the goal is and knowing the rules that are going to help you reach that goal and being free to do those rules. So it's only within the rules that we can truly, fully express ourselves. Fascinating. Have you ever spoken to your Buddhist friends like lately or in, in, like since you left and then they're like, what happened to you, man? No, we don't. We don't. 
don't didn't really have any internet then. Uh huh. Right. That so makes I, sense. I lost touch. Also, attachment it. suffering. So I guess <laughs> yeah. if they're attached to you, if something <laughs> would happen. It would be devastating. I actually took when I got married. I took my wife to India for four months, mm. and I did go back to one of the orphanages and a big. I wouldn't say Tadig, but the person who ran the orphanage, I love it. We used to sit up for hours talking about how yoga is good for the children. And I took him back there and he was very interested. He was like, oh, oh the Jewish people are very clever. And wow. They were very interested. That's so interesting. Did you ever get a chance to go down the Amazon? No, but I did run trips to Peru and Nicaragua. Hmm. Yeah, there was, I worked for an organization called Justify, which just if I, J U S T I F I, which we ran trips to Thailand and Sri Lanka and India and Peru and Nicaragua for American and English young professional Jewish people just to show them volunteer opportunities. I took them back, actually back to an orphanage that I worked with in Sri Lanka and in Thailand as well. So I went, I did get to go to South America, but I didn't ever canoe down Amazon. Not but yet. I don't feel I need to. Oh, you don't need to. Okay, good. That's a better answer than that. <laughs> yeah. Um, What's the biggest challenges that you find the guys and girls coming to Aish to discover themselves? What are the biggest challenges today? That the religious ones or the not yet religious Let's ones? Let's do both. For the religious ones, it's that you grew up with something and it never had necessarily so much warmth and joy and consciousness to it. So I come along this like Balchuva, everything's amazing. And they're like, like, I learned Gomorrah whilst you were sitting in some monastery. Don't tell me what it is. So it's very hard to renew something that they think they know, mm -hmm. where you don't have that with people who are coming in new. They're very open. Mm -hmm. For the Balchuvas, it's just letting go of a whole idea of what success means. You come in and success is your career. That is what makes you a successful person. And it's very, very hard to get away from that. I'm so, what's harder? What do you think is harder? Uh, for the, the Balchuva coming in to forget about that or for the firm person coming in that has to rebrand what they know? It seems that the Torah says it's harder for the firm person. Mm -hmm. It says tzaddik ben, the, the prayer of a tzaddik ben tzaddik is greater. Why? Because it's harder to do your prayer with consciousness. Mm. But the truth is that one's harder for them and that one's harder for them. Right, right. <laughs> Each person has the challenge that is uh, meant for yeah. them. But I think in a way it's harder for the from person. Mm -hmm. I spoke to this guy on one of the trips to Thailand, 27 years old, very secular. But when I was giving classes and stuff and he knew a lot. So I was on a bus journey with him. I said, come on, what's your story? He said, when I was 18, I became from, as like from's a four letter F word. You don't want to be from, you want to be observant, consciously and joyously observant. He said, I went from 18 to 24, very from, black hat, or Sameach, Gomorrah, 24, stopped being, came back to America, not so from now, nothing. So I said to him, well, when you were from, you made brachas. And he said, yeah, 100 brachas a day, the Gomorrah. Mm. I said, so what does Baruch mean? And he said, blessed. So I said, no, but what does blessed, what does that mean? What does Baruch mean? And he said, well, you know, it means like blessed, like holy. I said, no, no that's good. well. That, yeah. Right? No? Okay, but, no yeah, but yeah, yeah, that's one of the things. Okay, well, that's one of them. Okay, yeah. yeah. What was so there, he said, know? I said, no, holy is Kadosh. So he said, Baruch Ata means I'm grateful for you. I said, no, that's Hadaya. And he was like, you know, and I said, I do know. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know what Baruch means. So one of them is a wellspring. Mm -hmm. It's a wellspring. You are the source. It really means the source. In modern Hebrew, the word bricha is a swimming pool. So it means you're the source of everything. Everything comes from you. So if you're saying Baruch Ata Hashem, but you don't know what Baruch means, and when you say Ata, you don't feel you're actually saying you. You're not speaking to anyone. And Hashem is some man in the sky, then you're not going to get what Baruch Ata Hashem means. I, I actually think you shouldn't be able to finish a bracha. You should be broke at time, fall off your chair at that point. <laughs> so it just takes a little bit of consciousness and understanding, which is very, very hard when you have to say it a hundred times a day. I do get that, by the way. It's very hard. Yeah, and by the way, I've been about Shuva for 16 years. So that's hard then to keep it going. How are you going to put on to fill in? So mm -hmm. that's where my mindfulness training does actually help me. Because every day I can say Baruch and I can mean Baruch and I can feel the tefillin on my arm and on my head and what it means and understand more about it. Someone came into Aish a couple of years ago and he said, Rabbi, Shab Shabbat doesn't do it for me. And I said to him, well, what do you know about Shabbat? And he said, you can't turn on lights. And I was like, anything else? And he goes, yeah, you know, you can't do stuff. 
and he was an American football player. So I said, well, I get that. American football doesn't do it for me. And he said, well, that's because you're English. You don't know about American football. I said, oh, of course I know about American football. He said, what do you know? I said, you wear helmets. I was like, what? <laughs> that's what I know. Well, you wear helmets. Of course I know. So he, he didn't actually quite get it, but it's obvious. The more you know and learn about something, you get the meaning and depth of something, the more you're going to get out of it. So if I learn the names of all the the American football players and the rivalry between the teams and the different linebacker and quarterback and whatever it is, the more I learn about it, the more I'm going to enjoy the Super Bowl. But if I only know that you can't turn on lights and you can't tear toilet paper, then that's not great. Right. It's not so exciting then. Fascinating. Okay. We're going to get to your books. But before then, if there's one person from history that you could sit down with, hop a schmooze for a few minutes, who would it be? My first answer was my, one of my previous Gilgulim <laughs> to see what he was doing and why I ended up like this. I have to do you this. You don't think it would like mess you up? <laughs> like it'd be like too playing with now? It might not be the best idea. They say you're not really meant to know, but it could, it could help me. For someone who doesn't know, I don't even know much about Gilgul. What, what is a Gilgul? Incarnation, because we are a soul and souls come down into bodies and then at the end of the body's life, the soul goes back and then comes down into another body. So maybe to see the whole chain of all my, my leaving Egypt, just meet myself when I was leaving Egypt and standing at Mount Sinai and see what was going on there. Meet my wife. My wife's very, very holy and she, she's, she experienced us leaving Egypt together. Interesting. She said our souls were leaving and she told some details about one of a child, what happened, I'm not going to tell you, but. So maybe I'll have her on one day. <laughs> Shit, she's, my wife's amazing. I used to think to be a religious Jewish woman, you just have to wear black and be miserable and make babies and not speak. <laughs> but my wife's amazing energy healer and yoga teacher and artist and amazing. My wife. It's incredible. We'll be right back this week's episode. You've heard me talk about how you could save $18 when you go to twillery.com. Yeah, a full $18 when you spend $139. And I want to tell you all about their ear suit. You've probably heard me talk about it before, but did you go out and buy it? I don't think so. Listen up, ladies. If your husband wears suits, which he probably does, buy an ear suit for a gift because he will be thanking you for years to come. Years? Yes, years. The air suit is not only made with the most breathable technology that is patented, it also lasts a while. It just came out, so I can't tell you that it's lasted me for over five years. But when it comes to Twillery's clothing, I stand behind it because it lasts for a long time. I famously have their pants for over five years and still wear to this day. They have the most comfortable undershirts and their polo shirts are great too. Anytime I'm wearing any of their clothes, for whatever reason, someone's curious to feel how it feels. They feel it and they go, hmm, that's pretty comfy. Cause it is. It is not cheap to buy their undershirts, but let me tell you, it is an investment well worth it. First of all, from a holiness level, your tits go over it. You want your tits to be on something cozy. But more than that, your undershirt is on your skin. You're wearing it for a long time and you want it to catch the sweat and just make you feel good. And it is prime quality, like all the clothes at Twillery. So if you haven't checked out their air suit or got a pair of pants or gotten their awesome undershirts, go to twillery.com and use the code word INSPIRE for $18 off. Get it as a gift or get it as a gift for yourself because you probably deserve it. Now back to this week's episode. Do you ever get pushback from, I guess, because there is some truth to like, not truth, but like the Judaism that you describe of like the people in like closed-minded certain ways. Um, do you ever get pushback from that side or not necessarily? Like they sometimes see like, they hear the word meditation, they're like yoga and they're like, what's this, what are you, a Buddhist? And then obviously if the way you're describing it, it's like, no, this is, this like, is prayer. This give is, you all the sources. This is like, get, this is betachem, this is a muna. Like I, I know that, but do you ever get pushback from that side of like, you're too heebie-jeebie over here. Not to my face. Okay. okay that's <laughs> People good. seem to be really nice to me. Right. But I don't necessarily, because I also see the good in them. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say a bad thing. It's easy to compare the best Buddhist with the worst religious Jew. And that's not true. Mm. I've just arrived in America now, and I, I used to come quite often. Very open, warm, welcoming people. Lovely, amazing people. So, okay, they might not be davening the best mincha, 
but they're in the game, you know, they're, mm. they're still trying and they're still learning about character traits. So actually the from world is a, a loving, kind, conscious world. There's more tzedakah and chesed going on in this world than anywhere else in the world, I think. So I think people are more open to it if you say it and you give a source from the Gomorrah. <laughs> right, right. If you say it in a nice, loving, non-judgmental way. Is it, it goes all sides. When I became religious, people said, right, now give classes about how bad Buddhism and Hinduism is. And I was like, no way. Firstly, I don't think they're bad. I think they're really wonderful. I don't think they're true. But I think they're really wonderful things and we can learn things from them. Mm. But secondly, if I have to put other people down to look, make myself look good, what does that say about me? I'd right. rather just say how beautiful Judaism is. Right. Focus on the good that, that you have, not the bad that, or whatever just mm -hmm. on them. If there is one mitzvah out of the 613 that speaks to you a little more, which one is it? Can I have two? You could have two. Thanks. Shabbos and tefillin. Okay. Talk me into it. Why Shabbos and tefillin? Which, which is, I'm happy that you didn't say like prayer because I, because we spoke about that a lot, but I'm curious to know like, why is Shabbos and tefillin even more than prayer or that kind of stuff for you? And you can't get three. You already said two. Yeah. Like, this is it. No, Shabbos, because it really is the whole tachlit ma'aseh shemayim It's really the whole purpose of life is Shabbat. For many, many, oh, I want to give a five-hour shir on Shabbos now. But Shabbat comes from the word lashevet, or related to the word lashevet, which means to sit down. And for six days a week, we're rushing around and trying to achieve things. And for one day, is actually, hold on. We're, we're swimming the, in the waters for those six days. Is that, is that muscle makes sense? Yeah. However, by the way, shachrit minchan mariv and brachas are Shabbats in the, all through ah, the day. It's, it's giving us a moment to stop. Shabbat really means stop, sit down and Shabbat, shut up. Hmm. <laughs> so that's, so Shabbos is a day to just really experience your soul. It's meant to be. Obviously, we got kids running around and guests and it's not always like that. But the idea of Shabbat, especially in Jerusalem, the whole of Friday and you can feel it palpable. You can feel it palpably in the air and start singing Yadid Nefesh and, it's, and making kid. It's just so good in every way. And Tzvillin. And to fill in is, it just feels like the most crazy thing to <laughs> do. Why are you putting black boxes? What's right. wrong with you? It's just so weird. Right. In fact, it's so weird that for many Baltshuvers, including myself, it was very uncomfortable for the, the first time. First time I put on to fill in, I was 29 or 30. And I was like, it's, I feel like some naive, what's going on here? Right. But that's now what makes it so Jewish for me. Mm. It's like, I'm just such, and I'm proud I, I, and I hate taking them off. And obviously it's your head and your emotions and your actions. And seven times is chesed, gevura, tiferes, nezachor. There's so much deep wisdom behind it. So on one way, it's just so simple why it's my favorite because it's just so weird. And I like that. But the second one is it's so deeply beautiful, the teachings behind what Tefillin is doing. And you've got the name of God written on, you've got Shin Dalid Yud, which is the name of God written on your body. And David Amelech went to battle with this Tefillin on. It just, it seems like the epitome of Judaism. It's a great martial for life that like, it feels so weird, mysterious, ununderstood, but the there there is so much it's all wisdom. It's all perfect. It's all connected. You may not know that, but that like weird and perfection is like molded together. Because it's beyond our understanding in a way. The infinite consciousness is infinite and I'm finite, but he's given us these paths to connection. Okay. So I'm not exactly sure when this is going to air, but tell us about your your book. I mean, I know you have a book in the past and then you have a book coming out. Tell us yeah. about both of them. And of course, we're going to have links in the show notes for anyone who wants to buy them. Thank you. Can I say one more idea? Very important. No, sorry. We have to go talk about it. <laughs> I'm not gonna get, yes, yes, please, please, please. It's just about the physical and, and spiritual. Sure. I work at Aish, which is the opposite where the Beit HaMikdash was. It was Yaakov's dream. So the Yaakov dream, had the dream of the Tzula Mutzav Atzav Rasha Magia Shemaima. The, the ladder was planted in the ground and its head went up into Shemaim, spirituality. So this is Jewish spirituality, once again, in the East. I, I fasted once for seven days, not a full fast. I had two small cups of water and a little bit of papaya on three of the days for cleansing purposes. But the Eastern general path is complete detachment from physicality. You don't get married, you don't have money, you 
don't eat a lot of food. And the West is eat all you like, do everything. Judaism's got this beautiful middle road, which is that you can have money. It's okay to be rich, but just give at least 10, 20% of it to help other people. You can have physical intimacy just with the right person in the right way at the right time for the right reason. You can eat nice food, just make sure it's kosher and, and say a blessing before you eat it and after you eat it. So it's this amazing ladder of spiritual and physical coming together. And that's why Israel's in the middle of the East and the West, because it's, it's the Torah is the guidebook to be able to do this alchemy of bringing physicality and using it for spirituality. That blend. Love it. I okay. Love it. My book. Okay. Yes. So my first book, Mastering Life, a unique guidebook for Jewish enlightenment. It's basically lots of stories. Each chapter begins with a story of the country and then a lesson I learned in that country and then how Judaism has that lesson in a beautiful, profound way and then finishes off with a story. So it goes through each country and then at the end of each chapter, there's a practical exercise. Mm. So for example, the meditation one, sit up straight, start breathing through your nose, and uh, when your mind freaks out, just come back and it's and it's a victory. You're gonna yeah. do this by the way. By the way, you were yeah. right. It's two minutes a day. Do it for two minutes a day, it will completely that change your life. So much. Two minutes. One minute a day. Okay. Do it one minute. What, what time a day One minute, this? three times a week. We're gonna do a file. I'm gonna at the outro of this talk about my experience because between now and when we release this, there will be some time. So I'm gonna do it. One minute a day. And everyone listening, this is your homework also. Oh. One minute a day. Before or after Mincha? Because you're already in a kind of zone? A zone, okay. Well, I feel like mincha is the hardest okay. prayer because it's the middle of the day. Shachris? Before or after Shachris? My wife wants me home. Let's do my riff. My riff? Is that too bad? Is that Fantastic. Okay, my riff, fine. The, for anyone who is listening, yeah. whenever works for you. Right, fine. Okay. The no, I didn't know if there's like, no, you got to no, do no. that. Whenever Myriv, works for you. Fine. When, for when me, you're not going to fall asleep and you're not going to get distracted. Fine. One minute, just breathing. And then when your mind wanders... Don't get upset with yourself. Don't get frustrated. Just smile and come back. Smile and come back. Just train that. And what my what my objective is? Focus on your breath coming in, breath going out. The word for breath in Hebrew is neshima, which is connected to neshama. And Hashem blew Adam's soul into his nose. It's very important. And the word for smell is reach, which is connected to your ruach. Mm. So your nose is... Do I need to breathe in through my nose and very, breathe out very, through my mouth? You should always breathe in through your nose, even during the day as much as you can. There's an amazing book called Breath, not a Jewish book, amazing book called Breath. I suggest people read it. Yeah, my, and, my wife has this whole theory, not theory, but she, my son, he's a mouth breather and it's very bad because you got to breathe through your nose. And, ADHD, yeah. many things come from mouth breathing. But in this exercise, breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth or not necessarily? Out through either. Either, okay. Because while I'm doing this, I'm going to start doubting. I don't know if I'm no, doing good, it right. Good. So what's what? Very important. When you start saying, am I doing this right? Laugh at that voice. Okay. Come back and just do it however you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And then WhatsApp me and say, hey, right. do you okay, think fine. I should do that? Fine. But that's exactly what will happen. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly when rather than getting more lost in it or judging it, upset, frustrated, smile at that very voice itself mm -hmm. and then come back and you breath. And how do I how do I track the minute? Do I set a timer and the beeps? You set a timer. Got it. Okay, fine. So I don't, I shouldn't be thinking of no. the the minute. Okay. Although uh, although after thirty seconds you'll be like, this is more than a minute, right? I don't, I don't, <laughs> Did the thing not go? <laughs> I gotta check it <laughs> now. I can't stop doing this. Exactly. Perfect. Right. Yeah. So when I know. all of that happens, just smile. Come back. So fine. each each chapter has write a list of things you feel proud of yourself for for self esteem. Write list. Anyone who comes up to me and said, oh, I read your book, I say. Did you do the great yeah, boxes? The exercises? And they're like, no. I'm like, <laughs> and I say in the book, you're probably not going to do these exercises. Right, right. But it's very key. So it's practical. And then it talks about just every, each country and the descriptions of all the countries, the and mountains the and the people and the stories that happened there. And then my journey, how I got back to Judaism. and Really beautiful. Okay. And before we get to your... Um, my last question, we're going to... Let's talk about your new book coming out. New book. I just printed 100 copies. I self-published. It's called The Essential Teachings, and it's universal wisdom for creating a beautiful life that all religions, all philosophies, even atheists would, would agree on, I think. Just general things about how do you define success? How do you achieve success? How do you have emotional balance and mental strength and physical health? How do you deal with anxiety? Just the general, and it's very short, 80 pages. I do want to get it published by a non-Jewish publisher to get it out mm -hmm. and, or just give out 10,000 copies in colleges all over America. Wow. 
just to empower the world with wisdom that we can all agree on. And it's very, very simple, simple ideas and simple tools. If someone here uh, listening or watching this wants to get that book, are they able to or not even yet? I, I got one here. I'll give it to you. I will totally <laughs> happily take a copy. Yeah. I totally want At the moment, this. they're only about... But I, I know from our audience and like Baruch Shem, like when someone comes on and people like what they're saying and they want more, they're going to want to buy it. They're going to be upset. How... They can email me. Fine. DovBearCohen at gmail.com. Okay. And I'll print more soon. And but and but I'm trying. Oh yeah, let's. If, if anyone any can get a publisher, are, yeah, like, get a please. publisher. And then I got an online Jewish mindfulness course. Cool. LitMindfulness.org. L I T stands for Living in Tune, and it's eight weeks online of just. Being really nice to yourself. Mm. It's just breathe deeply and be nice. It's very, very, very important in all personal and spiritual growth that it's done joyfully. Mm. If there's any pressure or guilt or fear or uh, looking at other people or God's going to punish me, even if you end up doing the right things, you're not a healthy human being. So it's eight weeks of ideas like this. Just focus on your breath a little bit more. Think more positive things. Connect to your soul. Smell lavender oil to calm yourself down, have a hot bath, play some music. It's just physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well being. And just in a loving, sweet, playful, self compassionate way. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm going to ask you one or two questions. And we'll have links in the bottom for, for all of us, for anyone interested. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to ask one or two questions, so we'll see. My first and maybe final question is what would you tell your grandfather today? I'd say thank you for the inspiration. Baruch Hashem, I'm moving in the right direction. Someone said to me, oh, your book's called Mastering Life. You think you mastered life? And I said, no, that's why it's called Mastering Life. But I haven't mastered life, but I do know where I want to get, and I do know how to get there, and I am committed to doing that. So if I'm feeling good at the moment, and I'd say to my grandfather, thank you for the kick. Very beautiful. Okay, final question. Someone listening to this and they feel that you've gone through your journey, you've 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 searched and you found it, you're still going, you're still alive and kicking Baruch Hashem. But the, if they feel like they're a mess and they're watching or listening to this and like, yeah, I get it, but it worked for you. But what could I do? And they just feel like they're out of control. What advice would you have for them? Breathe. I'm being serious. Breath is the key to just getting some presence, and then saying, okay, let's start again mm. if we need to. To be able to take responsibility and say, it's not too late, and I can just breathe and start again. Actually, someone asked me a question the other day. You did philosophy at university, and you were in Asia for six years, and you studied in yeshiva for 16 years in Kabbalah. What's your one message for the world? And I said, chill out. <laughs> that really is. Everyone's so uptight. It's like, they need to make a decision. One of my students said, I don't, should I be a nurse or a preschool teacher? And I was like, well, either. They're okay. Chill out. You, you can make your decision. So for anyone who feels they're a bit out of control is self-care. Just breathe. Chill out a bit. And then from a more calm place, then we can make decisions what we need to do. It's You're reminding me of this comic strip of, I think it's, it's used in many ways, but the way I saw it is like there's two people on a bus. One person's looking out and it's all like shot, like happy and nice and sun and they're smiling. And there's other person on the other side of the bus looking out and it's like raining and gloomy. And the person looking out with it rainy and gloomy, it says, I'm 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 scared because I'm not in control. And the other person on the happy side says, I'm happy because I'm not in control. It's like the it was such a good description of like ultimate betachan of like Hashem's running the show. And we sometimes think we're running the show. And it's really about accepting that we're not running the show. Yeah, but we have an important role to play in the show. Mm. It's, your, it's all about our attitude. If you've got a good attitude, then you'll have a good life, no matter if it's sunny or rainy. And if you don't, then you won't. And we can take responsibility for our attitude. We have People have very difficult childhoods and difficult things, nature and nurture. So it's not our fault if we have a bad attitude. But at some point, we can choose to switch that and try and slowly and with self-compassion fix our attitude. Arido Vercon, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. I particularly really, 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 really enjoyed this episode. 
like I said in during the episode, I've been doing the breathing exercises. The first time I did it, it was actually pretty relaxing. The next time I did it, I got very anxious and felt trapped. But then as I did it, it was great. And I even found myself throughout the day just doing those breathing exercises and that helped me, I guess, tap into the moment. Uh, I really, I don't know. I, this is one of those episodes that like just shifted my perception of why we're here, what we're doing, and uh, what a great accent. Always, always uh, good when someone doesn't have like a New York accent here. If you haven't yet checked out our friends at Twillery, go order their suit. It is game changer. I was actually showing someone I was wearing the suit the other day and they're like, I'm going home and ordering this now. If you haven't reached out to Bitbean and you think that they can help your company, even if you don't think they can help your company, reach out to Bitbean. They are great. And I actually got the chance to tour their office this past week and got to meet a few of their staff and one after another. They're smart, kind, and really good at what they do. And if you haven't yet checked out Hiring for Less, go ahead and give them a call. They're great. They're easy to talk to and they could help take your business to the next level. If you got this far in the YouTube video, use the word epic, E-P-I-C. I want to see that word. Obviously, you can share your thoughts in the bottom. Have you ever uh, been born into Judaism and then lost your way and then found your way again? Or maybe you were never Jewish and you found Judaism, or maybe you are Jewish and and you're always from and you found Judaism. Whatever it is, we want to hear about your journey. Of course, you can leave suggestions in the uh, on the website, livingthechaim.com. You can check out our other podcasts. We have really incredible and awesome and powerful and influential and inspiring people coming up. Until next time, keep your inspiration kosher. Chaim. Living Lechaim.